So if we want to tap in to our inner confidence and sound like the experts that we are, when we want to feel calm, confident, and in control when we speak, because I believe that how we feel when we speak is just as important as how we sound. Welcome to the Podcaster's Guide to a Visible Voice. Reveal and define your voice to speak your truth through the power of podcasting. And I'm your host, Mary Chan. So, 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 let's go. Welcome to episode number 24. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And one of the things I love about podcasting is having interviews on your show. Because when you have those interviews, you get to meet like-minded people and share their stories as well. Having your own podcast lets you have access to people to interview. And usually it's a great way to really break that ice and try and connect with someone that you've been wanting to get to know. It's a good excuse to email someone and just to have a chat. And not only is it an intimate way to connect with your listeners, but also with your guests as well. One example is with Catherine Woods, my guest today. I was introduced to Catherine when someone we both know thought we'd have lots to talk about since we do very similar work through our voice coaching businesses. And boy, was she right. So I thought, why not? Let's connect, have a conversation, and do it all on the podcast. So here she is today. Catherine Woods is a communication and voice coach with over 20 years of experience as a speech language pathologist. She is also a recovering shy person and uses those aspects of her background to teach speakers, business owners, and executives how to use their voice to connect with their listeners when they speak. She is also a recovering shy person and fuses those aspects of her background to teach speakers, business owners, and executives how to use their voice to connect with their listeners when they speak so they can have more influence and make a bigger impact. Although we are both voice coaches and share the same love of amplifying people's voices, it was her background as a speech language pathologist that perked my interest. And since I don't have a medical background, I brought Catherine on today to share her medical perspective to voice work. We chat about tips for your voice from an SLP perspective, how breath is the foundation of your voice, plus what hurdles she overcame as a recovering shy person. You are going to love her insights, and I'd love to hear which one is your favorite. After you hear our conversation, send me a voicemail from my website, visiblevoicepodcast.com. There's that purple icon there that says send voicemail. You can drop me a voice message there or email me at visiblevoicepodcast at gmail.com. And let me know which tip you're going to use for your own voice. But first, you got to hear the conversation. So let's get into it with my guest today, Catherine Woods. Welcome, Catherine, to the show. It is so great to have you here because we do very, very similar work. And I love chatting with people in the same industry as me. So welcome. Thank you, Mary. I love this collaboration as well. Like I was saying, our similar work in terms of wanting to amplify voices and creating confidence in people's voices But what really drew me to you is the fact that you have the speech language pathology background. So I'd love to hear more about that. Explain what that role was for you. Well, it looked a number of different ways over the years. I was actively a speech pathologist for 20 years, have been out of that field for two years. And the thing that I did for the longest that made the biggest impact on me and most informed the work I do now in voice and communication coaching was when I worked in a hospital. And our specialty was working with patients who had been on ventilators, respirators, and had tracheostomy tubes, even in some cases, for an extended period of time and helping to wean them off of those and teaching them to speak and use their voice again in a healthy way that was effective for them in communicating. What I saw 
in those speaking and voice disordered patients was that they were not using optimal patterns of breathing to support their voice. And breath powers your voice, as you know, the way gas powers a car's engine. So when they had inefficient air supply, literally inefficient air supply to support their voice, they were in a lot of strain. Their voice wasn't easy to hear. It didn't sound good. It didn't feel good. It didn't last. So I started applying those therapeutic techniques that I had used with speaking in voice disordered patients for years to work with people who didn't have speaking in voice disorders, but just wanted to learn to communicate more effectively. Maybe they didn't like the sound of their voice or there were things about it that just weren't working for them in the sense that They didn't have an influential voice and teaching all of the physiological hacks, tips, and techniques that it takes to produce a voice that not only is healthy, but sounds and feels great and conveys you as an authority rather than having simple vocal mistakes that undermine your authority. Exactly. (laughs) that's what I go for as well. But you have this medical background. And whenever I think of speech language pathology, it's just so sciencey sounding and more about like the mechanics of the voice, or even like you said, being in the medical world with post-surgery or like myself, uh, quite a few years ago, I had a traumatic brain injury. I was run over by a car and I had a concussion and my words were stuttering because my brain couldn't catch up to my lips. And it was using some of these vocal techniques that I had learned from radio school to really propel me to get my brain to catch up to my lips because my lips knew what to do. And I'm guessing that the medical association with SLP work might be what a lot of listeners think of as well. So what is a common myth about speech language pathology? One of the common myths about speech language pathology is that all speech therapists or speech pathologists work with children in the schools. Oh, yes. Right. Yeah. And I have never worked in the schools. I've worked only briefly with children. So now transitioning to your business, what is still the number one technique from your SLP days in the medical world that sticks with you today for your clients? That number one technique, a hundred percent, is teaching proper diaphragm breathing to my clients. Back to the breathing again. Oh yes, definitely. Yes. We are born breathing from our diaphragms and we still breathe that way when we sleep. But yet Over the course of time, and it probably really starts in childhood when we have to go to school, sit at a desk, hunch over pen and paper, device, or book, and sit for hours on end. And it continues realistically on into adulthood. It only gets worse from there. And when our posture is hunched forward over devices. We just weren't meant as human beings. We were never designed for that. So what happens is that hunched forward posture makes it tremendously challenging to breathe properly from our diaphragms. In fact, the seated position is the most challenging position to maintain diaphragm breathing from, even though you can definitely train yourself to do this, and I've done that. It's still easier to do when standing or when laying on your back. So that diaphragm breathing and retraining individuals to breathe the way they were designed to breathe as their default waking pattern, rather than just doing it when they're asleep, is the number one change that we make. It's the number one habit change that we focus on before we do anything else. And it's kind of the least interesting or least sexy thing about what people think of with coaching. They're like, oh, I want to change my voice. You know, show me how to deliver this presentation. Show me how to have this great radio voice. <laughs> yes. And, and they get a little puzzled when I explain to them, 
it starts with your breathing. So the first thing we're going to do is go back and shift your breathing habits because everything else, every other shift in their voice and speaking habits is going to take place on the basis of the sound foundation of diaphragm breathing. Yes, I have that same thing with the people I work with too. They come in with, oh yeah, I want to get rid of filler words or I have this bit of a stutter or whatnot. And I'm like, breathing, back to the breathing. (laughs) Yes, it really does get back to the basics. And physiologically, we were never designed to breathe from our upper chest. It was only meant to be our body's fight or flight breathing pattern to get us quick gulps of air in a true life-threatening emergency when we needed to fight or flee from a predator. But if you put your hand just under your collarbone for anyone who's listening and one under your rib cage and you breathe and you see that top hand moving or you see both hands moving, That top hand represents upper chest breathing. And the problem with that being the fight or flight breathing pattern. Yes, I was just going to say that. (laughs) Yes, is that that pattern actually triggers your brain because our bodies talk to our brain. We all think about our brain talking to our bodies. And so we're going to psych ourselves into something by telling ourselves positive messages before we speak such as, I've got this, I'm in control, and that's fantastic. But the reality is our bodies talk to our brain just as much as our brains talk to our body. So if we want to tap in to our inner confidence and sound like the experts that we are, we need to tap into our diaphragm breathing and avoid the upper chest breathing because that upper chest breathing sends signals to our brain when we're using that fight or flight breathing that we're under attack. The brain releases stress hormones, which are supremely unhelpful when we want to sound calm, confident, and in control when we speak. In fact, when we want to feel calm, confident, and in control when we speak, because I believe that how we feel when we speak is just as important as how we sound. Yes, 100%. And with the fight or flight mode breathing too, it's actually not very healthy to be breathing that way because people start hyperventilating when you actually breathe that way. And so have you actually read the book Breathe? by James Nestor. It is in my Amazon cart as we speak. (laughs) And I have not. And a friend of mine that does breath work over in London was telling me about another book as well that I plan on purchasing. And I was trying to decide which one to read first because I have all the books, but I don't always have the time to read all the books. So I'm trying to put myself on a little bit of an information diet and select one at a time. And she had suggested one called the Oxygen Advantage by Patrick McCowan. So have you read that book? That one I have not read, but in the Breathe book by James Nestor, he talks a bit about his research in how we actually have too much oxygen, Mm. that we actually want more CO2. So actually those two books would be very interesting to compare as well. Well, it is important. And this is one of the things that I'm aware of from my medical background, working with respiratory failure patients who were coming off of ventilators and tracheostomy tubes. You do need a balance between oxygen and CO2. And that is one of the places I got to see how poor breathing habits versus efficient breathing patterns impacted people to the point that they were able to sometimes not stay off of the ventilator or be weaned from the tracheostomy tube if they were doing that upper chest breathing. And that really fascinated me in terms of applying that to the average individual who doesn't necessarily have a medical condition, at least not to that level, and what we could possibly do for ourselves in terms of our voice in optimizing our performance by using our body as it was designed to be used, breathing properly, because our upper chest muscles simply weren't meant to do that work of breathing. So it's exhausting. And especially if you're a person that has neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain, and you breathe from your upper chest, that would be one area. And this is a little off the topic of voice, but it's just symptomatic 
that could be one area where you could really see a shift in those types of chronic pain, potentially, if it's due to upper chest breathing. Yeah, I do feel that myself too. Like I was talking about that. I had that concussion and I have all this trauma in my body. And I have found that my body actually switched to the upper chest breathing. And I have a lot of tension in like my sternum and clavicle, and it has affected the way I speak because I'm, I feel like I'm grasping for more air than I used to pre-accident. And, you know, seeing that difference too really has propelled me to talk more about breathing. And so I think maybe that's why we're, we're going down this rabbit hole of breathing with our conversation today. Absolutely. Yes. I love the fact that you have the awareness of that because that's another thing, aside from the physical demands of a modern lifestyle, forcing people to sit at school desks and office desks. And I mean, modern in sense of, you know, from caveman times, our bodies weren't built for that. And it takes so many years for our bodies to adapt and evolve to where they would actually be okay with sitting all the time and hunching over devices. And we haven't reached that point yet. So we're paying the price of that with our posture, with pain, with how we feel, with how we speak. And this often happens to individuals when they've had an accident, illness, or injury, that they can get away from that diaphragm breathing. But just know that it is accessible to you to shift out of those patterns, both when you're awake and when you're asleep. Because I guarantee, unless you've been diagnosed by a doctor with diaphragm paralysis or something, in which case you would definitely know it, you'd probably be on a breathing machine, then you can use your diaphragm if it's not paralyzed. You can teach yourself to do it. Some people will be more challenged because of other medical conditions and, and physical symptoms situations that they suffer from, but you can learn to retrain your body and brain. And it's about having the awareness of it first. A lot of times people feel bad and, and sort of beat themselves up over it when they're in a situation where they realize they're doing that upper chest breathing and they get frustrated. But I always say, Hey, you're noticing it. That's good. Because before you were doing it, you just weren't aware of it. Now you're aware of it. You're catching yourself. So don't beat yourself up for catching it. Just recognize that as an opportunity to shift out of it. And it's not that difficult. It's just like you would shift any other habit by being consistent about it. Yes, the consistency is key. I love this topic of breathing, actually. But let's shift gears a little bit to talking about recovering as a shy person, because a lot of the people I work with have still a bit of shyness, even though they're like, okay, I'm going to start a podcast, but they hold their, themselves back. And you state on your website that you are a recovering shy person. How does a shy person transform herself into teaching confidence about voice? Well, it's interesting. I was honestly, one of the most painfully shy children you could even imagine, Mary. I was so shy that I was scared to look at people that I didn't know really well, even classmates that I wasn't friends with, much less actually talk to them. I became the kid who read self-help books at probably like age 11 or 12. Oh, wow. To pull myself out of shyness. And I did it just like I helped my clients. I did it by working on making one small change at a time. Because if you tell yourself, I'm going to do this and this and this and this, guess what? You're not. You're setting yourself up for failure. It's just too difficult for the vast majority of people to change so many habits at once. There may be a rare unicorn person that can do that, but I haven't met that person yet as a client. I believe tremendously in the power of making one simple shift at a time. And then once you're able to shift that habit, so we always start with the breathing. Once you change that habit, you can address the next habit and really get those embodied. And it's funny because we just got off of the breathing habit and you wanted to talk about how we help shy individuals to speak up more confidently. But guess what? It's the same. That goes back to breathing too, uh. <laughs> because that diaphragm breathing is what allows us 
to stay calm, confident, and in control. Oh, such a good point. Yes. Yes. It doesn't automatically make you recover from being a shy person. I want to be clear. However, you can really optimize that calmness, that feeling of being in control when you use the diaphragm breathing, because diaphragm breathing gets us into what's called our parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of our nervous system that keeps us calm. Right. Yes. On the other hand, going back to that upper chest breathing again, it's the devil. I'm telling you, (laughs) it triggers the fight or flight which is the sympathetic nervous system, which gets us nervous and prepares us to fight or flee. So by even just in the realm of shyness, the breathing does so much. And the other part of it is confident body language, which again, really goes right in line with breathing because you have to align your posture where you're upright in a confident posture. A hunched over posture is not a confident posture and also not one that allows diaphragm breathing. So the very basis of it is getting straight. This doesn't mean you have to stand with muscle constriction like you're in the military because that type of muscle constriction is the enemy of relaxed breathing. But really getting your posture aligned And standing up straight, looking at people, open body language. Again, it's an aspect of taking advantage of your body communicating with your brain rather than this hunched over posture, which is less confident and also communicates something different to your brain, which is that you're not feeling confident. Yeah, that is so amazing that you tied it back to breathing again. (laughs) I'm telling you, it's hugely powerful. It's amazing how fast it can shift in the moment. But the biggest mistake, tell me if you find this, Mary, with your clients. The biggest mistake people make is I'll be telling them about the diaphragm breathing and they say to me, Oh, great. The next time I get on stage, on a podcast, doing that presentation, leading that meeting, I will remember to use the diaphragm breathing. (laughs) Right. And I look at them and I say, no, no, you won't. You might do it for a minute, but you can't give the bandwidth mentally or emotionally to learning a new breathing pattern while you're also trying to remember what you're saying, being on stage, being present with your listeners, whether you're physically with them or just with them virtually, or even in a podcast where there's no video, you want to be with your listeners, thinking about what they're needing, being tuned in to, are they with me? Are they not with me? Especially if you can see them taking advantage of those body language cues, those eye contact cues. Are they confused? Are they with me? Am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? Do I need to clarify something? You don't want to be in your own head worrying about your breathing when you're trying to speak. It's the biggest mistake is thinking that you're going to look good and sound good by worrying about how you're looking and sounding in front of your listeners. It's the great irony that you're actually undermining yourself and not coming off as well. The best thing you can do is be able to be calm and be present and really engage with your listeners and let go of how you look and let go of how you sound and let go of how you're being perceived from an egoic standpoint and just be with them. And you can't do that while also trying to focus on a new breathing habit. So you've got to learn it when you don't need it so that it will be there for you when you do need it. Yeah, because breathing should be automatic. It just happens in the background. Yes, and when you learn to do it habitually, it is. Oh, I love this conversation. One last question for you. If a new podcaster is still a little shy to get started, or maybe, you know, they hold back when wanting to ask a question for their guests or something like that, what would you say to them right now to start speaking up more? I think aside from what we've already said, because I don't want to beat a dead horse about the breathing, I would say take advantage of standing when you speak, if you can, it will make you feel more powerful. It goes back to embodying confidence when you speak 
And I think it will actually make a change. I've seen it change for people. I have too. Yes. And it's as a bonus, it is easier to breathe properly when you're standing. But I really think it makes a difference. Think about it. There is a reason speakers stand on a stage instead of sitting. It really puts you in charge and makes you more confident. And the second piece of advice I would give, if you're really reluctant to ask these questions and go down a certain road and really claim your expertise on a podcast, maybe start with recording a couple that are with people you know really well and feel really comfortable and then try to emulate that style of conversation with people you don't know as well over time. But I would say break into that confidence by talking first to people you feel really comfortable with. I love it. Those are great tips and so many things that I totally align with as well. But I love hearing it from your perspective and your point of view. So Catherine, thank you so much for joining me here today. And thank you so much, Mary. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to the Podcaster's Guide to a Visible Voice. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love it if you'd share it with a podcasting friend. And to reveal more voicing and podcasting tips, click on over to visiblevoicepodcast.com. Until next time.